The Emergence of Kurdish Nationalism. 1880-1925. In his masterful study of relations between Europeans and non-European peoples, Europe and the people without history. Eric Wolf refers to Western concepts of so-called primitive peoples as without history, that is, populations supposedly isolated from the external world and from one another, a fallacious view as he goes on to show. One might also speak of peoples with denied history. The application of such a phrase, an idea to the peoples of Western Asia in fact makes a great deal of sense when one thinks of the Palestinian Arabs, Armenians and especially the Kurdish people in the last hundred years. The modern history and political struggles of this last group form the subject of this book. As Middle East specialists are well aware, the Kurds are a separate and distinctive nationality living, except for exiles, in an area often referred to as Kurdistan, in which they make up the majority of the population, a region comprised of eastern Anatolia, extreme northeastern Syria, northern Iraq, northwestern Iran and parts of southern and southeastern Soviet Armenia. In addition to having occupied this area for centuries, the Kurds also share a common language, which, although related to modern Persian, is a separate Indo-European tongue, the majority of its speakers speak three dialects, one variously known as Comanche or Kermanche, another as Sorani, and the third as Kurdi. A minority of Kurds speak another dialect most often called Zaza. Whatever the dialect, the Kurdish language is distinct with respect to its grammar, syntax, and vocabulary. In addition, the Kurds possess a folklore and literature of long standing, including chronicles, poems, and, since the late 19th century, journalism. Although it is impossible in a brief examination of this sort to devote a great deal of attention to the early history of the Kurds, which is in any case complex and even controversial. It should be emphasized that they have resided in a fairly compact and homogeneous fashion in Kurdistan since ancient times, at least since the time of the Medes. Living in the mountainous areas of the Taurus and the Zagros and adjacent valleys, the Kurds were exposed, like other peoples, to various waves of invaders and to different governments, but they managed to enjoy periods of relative autonomy or quasi-independence thanks to topography and the declining fortunes of one or another ruling dynasty. After the Islamic conquests of the Middle East, the Kurds came under the authority of the various Islamic dynasties, but by the 10th century, as elsewhere in the Eastern Islamic world, the Kurds had begun to experience much greater freedom from the writ of caliphal governments, and Kurdish chieftains and leaders had become active in the establishment of small, virtually independent dynastic principalities. The Mongol, Safavid, and Ottoman invasions wrought much devastation and dislocation among the Kurdish population, but Kurdish notables and local rulers were able to utilize Perso-Turkish disputes in their own interests for at least a part of the time between 1514 and the late 17th century. By the early 18th century, the Ottoman Empire was experiencing such difficulties at the level of central government that local Kurdish princes were able gradually to assert themselves, and to enjoy virtual autonomy. It was only with the reform and centralization efforts of Sultan Mahmud II, 1808-1839, that the Kurdish emirs, example Muhammad Pasha of Rwandus and Badir Khan Beg of Bhutan, were brought to heel. After the suppression of the princelings, Effective power and leadership in the Kurdish community passed into the hands of a new kind of political leader, the Sheikh. Through piety, charisma, matrimonial alliances, and wealth, Sheikhs associated generally with the Naxbandi or Qadiri Sufi orders came to enjoy much power and prestige by the 1870s. After the Ottoman defeat of the princes, Disorder and lawlessness prevailed in Kurdistan and the Sheikhs were the only moral force capable of restoring any sort of peace and order. As a result, one sees the rise of the Sheikhs of Semdenan, Barzanka, and Barzan by the 1850s. As Professor Wadi Jwaida has shown, the rise to prominence and power of the Sheikhs demonstrated the desire of the Kurdish people to fill the power gap caused by the fall of the princes. The rise of Sheikh Ubaidallah in the late 1870s is illustrative of the great role the Sheikhs had come to play in Kurdistan.
Ubaydallah's revolt, however, was also significant for another reason. It marked the emergence of a political force directed toward unification of the Kurds and their rising, unsuccessful. It must be noted, the Sheikhs played a role of considerable magnitude in Kurdish nationalism and Kurdish autonomist political and military movements. One must not bellabore the obvious, but it must be appreciated that for the Kurds nationalism and religion became intertwined, in effect, from the beginning. One must understand the role of the Sheikhs and of this mixture of nationalism and Islam in order to appreciate this book and, for that matter, the modern history of the Kurdish people. After the Young Turk Revolution of 1908, Kurdish political clubs and societies were established in a number of cities within the Ottoman Empire, including Istanbul, Mosul, Diyarbakir, and Baghdad. In addition, young Kurds, especially members of prominent families such as the Badir Khan and Baban, began to travel outside the Middle East, example, to France and Switzerland, for their educations. Inevitably, members of this emerging intelligentsia became acquainted with Western-style nationalism and other political concepts, leading to a heightened awareness of their own national traditions and values. Some have argued that these intellectuals and their ideas were generally viewed with suspicion and distaste by traditional political and religious leaders in Kurdistan. In fact, the research of Dwider and Olson shows that nationalist ideas were not rejected out of hand by leaders in Kurdistan. In fact, nationalist concepts came to be accepted and propagated by the religious brotherhoods and the Sheikhs of Kurdistan. This last development was of paramount importance for the evolution of the Kurdish national consciousness and movement. Since the Sheikhs were so closely identified with the Kurdish masses, their espousal of nationalist ideas was a major avenue for the spread of a Kurdish national identity and programs among the masses. The diffusion of such ideas was facilitated by the fact that they came from traditional Islamic leaders who stood in opposition to the secularism clearly identified with Turkish leadership and government circles after 1908. In fact, as Olsen demonstrates, the secularism associated with the Young Turks and then with the Kemalist reforms, was a primary factor in the ideology of Sheikh Said's revolt. In the aftermath of World War I when the Ottoman Empire had disappeared and the situation in the Near East was fluid and uncertain, to say the least, it seemed that the Kurds and other nationalities might benefit greatly from the new order that the victorious allies seemed ready to impose, upon the Middle East. In fact, a spokesman chosen by Kurdish nationalist organizations attended the Paris Peace Conference, and it looked as though the Kurds were going to realize their fondest dream, a national state. The Treaty of Savries, signed in August 1920, dealt with Kurdish affairs in Article 62-64. Article 64 in effect gave the Kurds the opportunity to form an independent state in Kurdistan, at least in those parts formerly belonging to the Ottoman Vilayet of Mosul. Unfortunately for the Kurds, the treaty was rendered inoperative by the actions of Mustafa Kemal and his forces. The Kurds had come up against two of the brutal facts faced by so many nationalist movements before and since. Competing nationalisms mean trouble for smaller or less powerful groups and offer keen instruments for diplomats and politicians of the great powers. As Olson shows, the Kurdish nationalist cause provided a tool for at least potential manipulation and realpolitik on the part of strong states, within and outside of the Middle East. One of the major themes of the book, in fact, is the way in which the Kurds were used as pawns in the policy struggles between Britain and Kemalist Turkey. One sees not only the Turkish fear of British designs on the Middle East, but also the nature of the struggle that threatened to break out over Turkish-Iraqi borders. Interestingly enough, however, this book shows quite clearly that the rebellion of Sheikh Said was a Kurdish matter, not a British put-up job to use against the Turks in the interests of an Iraqi Mosul. In addition, Olson provides extremely important information about the role the Kurds played in British imperial policy divergences and disputes among makers of that policy, and the nature of the techniques employed to sustain that policy, such as the use of air power. Sheikh said and the Kurds were of far greater interest to the British than they probably ever realized. In the final analysis, however, 
This book is a story of the relationship between Turks and nationally conscious Kurds since World War I. It is very important to understand how the rebellion affected the future of the Kurds in Turkey and, for that matter, other potential opponents of Kemalism within the Turkish state. The nature and number of Turkish army campaigns in Kurdish areas should be particularly noted. More Turkish military actions have been carried out in Kurdistan than in any other area of Turkish concern, foreign or domestic. Obviously, the Sheikh Said rebellion left a legacy of bitterness, mistrust, and suspicion that has subsisted for decades. Those observers familiar with Turkish military actions in eastern Anatolia within the past few years will undoubtedly find much of interest in the present volume. The hostility and suspicion of the Turkish government toward dissenting or opposition groups also becomes much more significant in light of the information provided here. The said rebellion made possible and even seemed to justify draconian measures against opposition groups, whose ideologies were seen as constituting a major challenge or threat to Kemalism. Sheikh said and other leaders were executed, the rising was put down forcefully, but the problem did not simply vanish. Other Kurdish rebellions occurred in the late 1920s and early 1930s, and Kurdish desires for independence or autonomy have not disappeared. The issue of conflicting nationalisms has not gone away, in all likelihood, it will not do so. Furthermore, the Sheikh Said rebellion showed many years ago something that some observers have associated only with Iran in recent times, the possibility of a symbiotic relationship between nationalism and religion. In fact, long before Ayatollah Khomeini began his crusade in 1963, it had been quite effectively shown that nationalism in its seemingly modern Western sense, shared language, cultural forms, history, contiguous territory, etc., and religion, in this case Sunni Islam, were by no means incompatible, at least at the level of political policy and struggle. William F. Tucker